Today, Joe Wilkes is back in town. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And uh, I'm pleased to say that Joe Wilkes from New Zealand is back in town. Hello, Joe. Hi, Martin. Very good to see you again. Seems yeah, like I'm... an incredibly long time. <laughs> Five months since our last conversation. And I can count on, you know, many, many times the number of people from New Zealand said, what's happened to Joe Wilkes? We need Joe back because we're not getting any sense of what's happening in New Zealand. So, yay. Yeah, well, um, apologies for my absence. I was, um, uh, I suppose, hamstrung by a, a commitment that I'd had a, in a contract contract role, which um, uh, meant that uh, my uh, my outpourings of, of uh, I suppose, reality on uh, on the New Zealand housing situation uh, was not deemed to be in the best interest of the business I was working for. So, um, uh, having been permanently furloughed recently, um, I'm allowed to come back. So, uh, you know, <laughs> businesses are, businesses yeah. are looking at things and costs, and um, I was uh, probably a slightly more expensive consultant than some of the uh, the other people that I had within the workforce. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm I suppose one of uh, one of the statistics that haven't yet come out in the um, unemployment figures I, I won't go and claim unemployment benefit but um yeah no, the uh, head office that i uh, in the business i was working for they've um pretty much downscaled their numbers by about 20 percent so far so um yeah it's an interesting time and um i suppose we we were talking uh well for i guess 18 months or no 12 months from november november 17 about um uh, sorry, November 18, about what could could happen and what we saw building up in the system. And uh, we've now had that, uh, I suppose, the black swan event that's created turmoil everywhere. Yes, and, uh, you know, a lot of people, of course, are blaming the virus. But the fact of the matter is the cracks were already showing and essentially the virus has exposed the weakness in the financial system, the weakness in the property sector. And uh, all the things that we've been discussing for quite some time, unfortunately, now are there in f sort of the front of mind of everybody. And uh, yeah, well, it's it's phenomenal. I mean, we were, I suppose, talking for you know twelve months or so about the uh, the policies that were being enacted by by the RBA and the RBNZ, um, cuts in interest rates, uh, dramatic cuts in interest rates, just before we went into to level four lockdown. Um, we've, we've come out of, of level four into level three a couple of days ago. Um, but yeah, the the whole monetary system and the the, the need to to keep the the household debt momentum growing um, was you know there in, in evidence for everybody to see. Um, I was uh, you know I was quite impressed with how the Reserve Bank of New Zealand were able to kick start credit momentum with their, their cuts cuts in the interest rate at the end of last year um, because we did see a, a fillip in the housing market in November December January February March. Uh, so January, February, March was actually not a bad month until the last six days when we went into lockdown, um, and transaction levels were up. Uh, lending was was again uh, growing, uh, and the pace of credit growth, is, which you and I see as the, the key to the housing market success, is that that had come off from 16, 17, um, and you know where the, the annual growth in household debt was around nine percent at its peak. Um, that have fallen to around 6% annual growth um, throughout much of 18 uh, and during the early part of 19. Um, when the governor cut the cash rate last year to 1%, so the 1.5% to 1% to cut, that ignited the credit fuel again. Um, and as we went into January, February this year, credit momentum was back growing at 7% per annum. So um, over the, I guess, 18 months that we've known one another, Martin, we've, we've seen um, the household debt levels in terms of uh, mortgages go from uh, about 255 billion dollars in New Zealand uh, it's just tickled over 280 billion recently so we've done quite a good job of growing growing household debt pile um, over a very short space of time over 18 months so if you look at that and that's um, 25 uh, yeah 25 billion dollars worth of, of newly created money into the economy through housing debt um, the measures that the uh, RBNZ and Treasury have already taken, uh, $33 billion worth of, of Treasury bonds purchased, that is actually um, greater, $8 billion greater than the, the increase that we've seen in, in household debt over the late, last 18 months. So, um, yeah, it's 
unusual times, absolutely phenomenal times. Um, and I'm, I'm intrigued to see how this all plays out as we go through, go through the next six, 12 months um, mm-hmm. and, and what happens. Well, it's interesting. I don't know whether you saw the Westpac New Zealand uh, paper that they came out this week, but they were basically saying that they think with uh, 0.25% official cash rate in New Zealand, that, that the Reserve Bank in New Zealand will need to take rates into negative territory. So they're suggesting that it could go down to minus 0.5%. And yeah, well, that's a question. That's a question I asked when I went to um, to breakfast with the ANZ economist a while back in the post that we did last year, saying, you know, mm. are you preparing to turn rates negative? Mm. Uh, and that was around the time that we were talking about the cash ban mm. uh, that you, you guys were looking at uh, legislating over in Australia. So, yeah, I, I you know, Dominic Stevens, uh, the chief economist at Westpac, I, I find his um, uh, yo-yoing and seesawing quite phenomenal because it was only, it was only, only January that he was predicting nine percent increase in house prices this year. So. Um, obviously, something's changed. Yes. So, I mean, he is still holding for a forward view of house prices going up again on the basis that actually the cost of mortgages will go down even further if negative r- r- rates follow. But what he did say was that the reason they've got to do that is because there will be a limit to how much money the Reserve Bank of New Zealand can print. In other words, how much of the Treasury uh, you know, portfolio they can buy because you know they can't buy all of it, otherwise they'll just completely control the market. So there are some limits with regard to what the RBNZ can do and therefore negative rates might follow. But um, I thought that uh, their conversation point then about, well, it looks then as though that will drive house prices higher is a little bit optimistic because I think that they're not taking into account the fundamental shift in the psychology of individuals and businesses, right? I think that people have not understood that whilst you might go down the escalator into a bit of a crisis, the climb up is through the stairs, not the escalator up. And this takes a long, long time. And uh, unemployment will probably be quite a lot higher than people are thinking, and it will take a long, long time. So my own view is the prospect of uh, price growth in New Zealand now is pretty much off the agenda at least the next couple of years. Yeah, well, they're they're going to do everything they can to to get the momentum back in the housing market, and, and the real estate sector has opened up for business again two days ago, so people are able to get market appraisals. Um, you're allowed to show two uh, two prospective purchases a day around properties, but on an um, individual basis rather than uh, the historic open the door up on a Sunday or Sunday morning for half an hour and have you know fifteen twenty people thirty people looking. So that's um, obviously forefront of their mind they want to get get the transactions going again and transactions dropped off a cliff um the last six days of, of march so and those would have been deals done that probably were negotiated prior to the lockdown um i think that uh Arient had said something like 60 percent fewer transactions in that first six days of the lockdown than than the comparable six-day periods in the three weeks leading up to them so it's um yeah it, they're, they're, they're desperate to get something going um we've got um the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but they have now uh, removed any requirement for um, a deposit, which yep. um, <laughs> you know, we've got major banks talking about house price falls of, of anything from 10 to 30 percent um, in Australia and New Zealand. And they're removing the deposit limits for the, I guess, the, the young to, to go in and um, the, the low interest rate environment, you know, with the cut to the cash rate to 0.25 percent. Uh, mortgage rates have followed, but they haven't followed to the same extent. So the 0.75% cut has been passed on. I think 0.3% is about the best pass on a rate. So rates um, for, for mortgage money is still in the early 3% generally. Um, I would expect that to drop into the twos. Um, and we, we still have a very strange environment here where um, if you look at the UK where they've got a quarter percent cash rate, um, most deposits, uh, I think Lloyds Bank recently told me that my, my um, uh, interest on my deposit account was 0.01%. So um, <laughs> over here, you can still get um, deposit money in, in the 2%. So um, how how many people will keep those deposits if those rates go down into the ones? Um, you know, Will that spark a, a, an energy for people to go and borrow to, to buy investment properties? I don't know. Um, anecdotally, Um, I've spoken to a number of agents over the last couple of days um, and it appears that there is actually quite a bit of activity in the the lower bound sector of the market. Um, uh, One of my uh, my contacts said that they listed a house two days prior to lockdown. Um, Lockdown was announced and they had to to shelve any viewings on it. But I've had over 120 people want to come and visit the property. But it is at the lower end of the market. It's a $300,000 purchase. 
the mortgage side of things, as we stepped into this, um, February's lending data from the RBNZ um, shows that first home buyers were um, increasingly taking on uh, more debt at low deposit levels. Uh, and the average mortgage, and I think we were talking 12 months ago that, you know, first time buyer mortgages were around the 420, 430,000 uh, mortgage size. And I'm still skeptical about whether it's total mortgage or, or loan size. Um, but the um, the loan size or mortgage size reported by RBNZ, um, that crept up to uh, 517,000 in February. Um, so that's yeah really stoking the fires and and the transaction levels um february wasn't a bad month february was was you know one of the best months in terms of transaction volume since 2015 so um it's it is uh yeah the the, the younger generation are again still being encouraged to to prop up prop up the, the you know prop up the debt and, and keep that debt momentum growing right and what's the latest with regards to the momentum with on employment because presumably a lot of people are now uh, on the bench, as it were, um, but presumably being supported by government uh, support in the short term. Uh, because, uh, you know, certainly my data suggests that quite a few of those first time buyers in Australia who bought, there was a scheme with a 5% deposit, and a few people piled into that from January. And some of those bought, and their prices are, have already slipped. So essentially, they've lost all the equity they put in the property to start with. Yeah. Well, we've um, we've seen uh, support measures and, and there's discussion at the moment of around 40% of, of New Zealand workforce is, is on a, um, a government-backed guarantee. Government-backed guarantee. Uh, I'd guess every real estate agent in the country has taken the $7,000 um, contribution to, to reduce the income. And you had to prove that your income was going to be less than 80% of what it was, and there's no way there's no way any real estate in the a real estate agent in the country uh, will be maintaining. Um, Eighty percent or above, just on the, the transaction volumes, have been absolutely hammered. Can't do anything. Can't show anyone a house. Um, and you know, if you look at how many people really do buy um, sight unseen, you know, off the back of a video, it, it's always low. Mm. And the big thing for me is, is, is the impacts that we're seeing in the, um, I suppose, the, the tourist market. Um, I was travelling around New Zealand quite a lot leading into the the final phase before lockdown. I've just extensively travelled the two two or three weeks before. Um, visited uh, Tauranga, New Plymouth, Taupo. Um, I've been down to Christchurch, been down to Invercargill, Dunedin, Queenstown, um, and this is this was literally all in the two weeks prior to prior to the lockdown coming in. And there's severe stress already. Um, I, I took the advantage. I took the opportunity to do a skydive in uh, Queenstown on uh, well, the sixth of March, I think it was, and that was uh, no eighth of March. And that was a lovely sunny day, um, end of the summer holiday season. Um, and the guys there, who were, one was a pom, one was a, one was a kiwi, who I spoke to the, the, the instructors, they were saying that they were looking at you know literally twenty five percent of the number of jumps that they would you know typically do at that time of the year. So already there was stress. Um, I stayed in a hotel in Queenstown where I was one of two one of two guests mm. um, uh, you know a hotel with a hundred rooms um, and these these areas are being hammered um, you know the Salvation Army have, have called for a, uh, you know basically a refugee crisis in Queenstown which is you know the, one of the, the second most expensive housing market in the in the country leading into the leading into the um, the, the lockdown um, they've got 5,000 workers there that they're claiming are unable to pay rent and unable to support themselves from from eating because the whole tourist industry shut down. Um, how does this manifest itself? Uh, data from 2018 um, says that 2% of, of New Zealand properties, um, so 37,000 out of a, a, a total base of about 1.8 million units, 2% um, are Airbnb accommodation. Um, and these these people, many are quite leveraged. Um, they do it because they can get better rents on a, you know, through the holiday period, you can go rent a place out for $2,000, $2,000 a week rather than seven or $800 a week to, to you know, a long term tenant. So they do occasionally pay slightly high prices. That's a lot of a lot of property though, 2% of your, of your, of your, of your units in the country going to be competing with um, uh, your hotel rooms. Uh, you can get some fantastic deals uh, in the in the forward in the forward diary for some of the holiday spots. And and this this concentration isn't across the whole country. Um, Auckland's a big recipient. Uh, Wellington and Christchurch, obviously the two other big big cities. They they are um, they make up a, a reasonable portion of the Airbnb market. And then it's places like the Bay of Plenty and Queenstown. So there's probably five areas where this type of of uh, of change in dynamic is going to have a have a, an impact. 
Well, it's very interesting in Australia, they've uh, pretty much frozen Airbnb. So uh, a lot of people with Airbnb properties have now tried to get longer term rentals. So the number of rental listings uh, has actually gone up quite a lot. Uh, at the time when rentals are actually dropping, you know, in Sydney, they're down 20, 30 percent in some areas. So people <laughs> are being completely squeezed. And uh, my modeling is suggesting that some of those Airbnb guys are going to be very much caught insofar that they will not be able to get the income that they were getting in previously from their property. They've still got the mortgage and uh, therefore some of them are now turning to thinking, well, if I can't actually rent it long term, maybe I should sell. So we're starting to see this sort of uh, what I call the start of the four sales, not four sales from the bank, but four sales from some property owners who just don't think that this particular proposition works anymore. And uh, that's going to put potentially upward pressure on supply side. So more properties coming on the market, another reason why I think um, prices will fall. And of course, the other factor here, we, we've got no migration. Well, we had a strong migration, 300,000 last year. No migration now. So the other demand force of international is gone. Yeah, well, we're going to, you know, I think that we're, we're, we've done the right thing in terms of our, our lockdown measures. So I think that it was it was dramatic, but it, it's been successful. Mm. Um, got to be careful over the next couple of weeks that we, we don't start reinfecting each other. Because the, the thing the thing I found is quite interesting about COVID-19 is that um, the measures are, you know, they're, they're fairly thorough, but we're all still going to supermarkets and we also have to get get our food. Um, the clusters that we've seen in, in New Zealand, you know, like a, there was a wedding down in Bluff where, you know, 70 odd people, 80 odd people have been affected as a result of, of one person attending a wedding. So it's obviously quite, you know, pretty contagious. Mm. Uh, and yet that hasn't really manifested itself into more community transmission. So we've, we've, we've done a good job and Kiwis have been, you know, very, very thorough and diligent in, in their care for, for one another. Um, I'm... I'm just in, I'm intrigued to see what happens as, as we're we're allowed out to to do to do more and and, and be more be more active. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens there. I've actually got a cousin of mine who um, arrived in New Zealand uh, about three weeks before um, the the lockdown measures, and um, he's been stranded in Taupo in an Airbnb. So he's paying someone's Airbnb for a, for, for a little while, so, and he's looking at it and just saying, "Well, look, fuck yeah, I can't I can't do anything in the UK, so there's no point in going home at the moment." So mm. I, I get it you may as well just stay here could go for some nice walks around Taupo um, so there's there will be people who are at the moment trapped and probably paying Airbnb prices um, but when the airports open up um, you know I, I can't see us being open for for, for travel coming in I mean you, you look at the, the China the China flight numbers and I think Auckland was getting I think it was 20 flights a week uh, from from China uh, in February and that dropped down to four by the middle of February um, Christchurch, I'm guessing, and Queenstown, we've, we've seen a, a massive drop off. And um, without that, you know, if, if tourism really is 10% of GDP, and then you think about the velocity flow of the money from from that tourist spend around other industries, um, the, the knock-ons, the knock-on could be could be quite significant in some of these areas. Well, that's right. And uh, you know, there's a chance. I think and I remember listening to I think Winston Peters saying, "Well, maybe we could create an economic zone between Australia and New Zealand, right? Because if the uh, infection rates are low in both countries, we can sort of, you know, do a little bit of trans-Tasman activity. And maybe that's right. Um, but that's not going to really make up for all of that international uh, travel that was there. It's such a critical part of Australia and New Zealand. Of course, Australia also a big education sector, which has gone as well. Yep. Um, so the, these are huge chunks of the economy, effectively, now on ice. And uh, I agree with you. I think it's highly unlikely that we're going to see international travel uh, really ramp up anytime soon. So this is going to be a big, uh, you know, a big drag on the on the broader economy. Um, I guess the other question then is, um, you know, how does this play out? Because as you say, as you start opening the taps, do you then start seeing infections rise again? It seems to me a lot of the issues in Australia were actually off the cruise ships, which are definitely gone. So that's sort of helpful now. But there's still a little bit of community transmission going around in some areas by the look of it in sort of a few hotspots. And they're only just getting the testing up, up to speed now. So we're still sort of a bit, a bit early as to know what's going on. But they are talking about a bit of relaxation around the edges. So I'll see how that plays out. Yeah, well, we're 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 now at the stage that we're we're preparing to come from level three to level two, and and that's that's the you know the, the section when uh, restaurants can open up, bars can open up. Uh, there will be limits on on the size of of, of gatherings, so mm. you still have limited numbers, and the, and the bigger events won't won't be happening. Um, 
But as as we come out of that, a lot of the bank economists um, had a, a, a good look at some stuff that uh, Jared Kerr, the Kiwi bank economist, was was suggesting, and, and it makes sense to me. If you're going to if you're going to go and print more money, then it, it should find its way into households. Um, so they're talking about fifteen hundred dollars per man. Uh, and I think it's five five hundred dollars per child being injected into into the economy um, as we go out and into level two. I don't think we'll get the announcements on any of this though, until the budget on May the fourteenth. So right. that's quite a big budget that's a couple of weeks away, and I, I don't think they'll I don't think they're going to go and shoot the shoot the you know the, the, the you know or open the open the stable door until that's that's uh, out of the way. How much more stimulus are we going to see? Um, it's going to be it's just going to go. Haywire. It's going to get haywire. Yeah, oh, it's going to be more. There's definitely going to be more stimulus. And uh, interesting, our budget got pushed back until later in the year. Although there will be a short, a short statement. But uh, yeah, my read is that um, you know the stimulus to date really has only just been a sort of a, a very quick uh, fix. But this economy and the New Zealand economy will need significant support into the longer term to be able to turn the um, you know the trajectory around again and try and get the economy firing again. Uh, like I said, I think it's going to be a long, slow haul. So yeah, expect way more stimulus, and um, I hope that it's focused on the right areas. My worry is that there's going to be a lot of focus on trying to stoke the housing market. You know, more first-time borrowing incentives. You know, uh, more more great tax breaks for investors. I can just see it now, and, and there have already been cries here in Australia for um, uh, New South Wales, for example, to buy some of the high-rise buildings that haven't been sold and take them on the on the public uh, on the public record, basically as a public housing for a, for a period of time. I mean, the whole thing is just save the housing sector, never mind the economy. That seems to yeah. be the way that the uh, philosophy is uh, cooking at the moment. Yeah, and I, I think I think my, my, my feelings have probably changed on this. I, I, you know, the housing market is is the thing that's got us into this vulnerability now, and it's it's the same in, in most of the Western world. Mm. Um, this is a, a time, uh, you know, if you if you are going to go and inject huge amounts of government government created money into into economies, it needs to be focused on all right. Okay, how can we um, re reinvigorate our supply chains? Um, the supply chain issue that it's it's going to take it's going to take ages to unwind this this mess um but it is an opportunity if you do have big levels of of, of, of unemployment and I, I can't see anything that, other than that happening there's projections of 10 percent. i think it's i think it will probably end up being a lot higher than that and mm. we won't know for a long time because a lot of people are still on the government back guarantees the mortgage payment holidays um, have been significant so there's a lot of a lot of people who've gone on applied for deferred deferred mortgage arrangements a lot of people who own businesses that they've, they've financed against a family home those businesses will open up to a completely different world um, without the, you know, without the four million or so people that visit the country every year. Um, that's good. it's going to have a huge, huge impact on a lot of businesses. So, um, my my feelings are that if you have got this, and it is it is time. You know, I, f- I hate state control stuff, but I think it is time for for business leaders to go and get together and start saying, okay, what is it? What can we do? What can we produce within our countries that we need? Um, that you know. Fair enough. We've got used to buying it cheap from somewhere else, but actually, we're buying it cheap, but it's breaking every <laughs> breaking every eighteen months. So maybe we should be looking at you know building stuff better and, and building it at home, and creating creating those um, uh, those industries and those businesses back in the country. Now, I can't see New Zealand really being uh, um, you know having the, the the resources to go and start building cars or anything like that. But I think that there's a lot of stuff that we you know we we, we ship out an enormous amount of primary produce. Um, if there are housing issues around the world, we need to start looking at focused efforts to produce proper, proper sized and scaled uh, manufacturing businesses. If they're producing flat pack homes like the Germans do, like the Scandinavians do, we have the resources to do that. Um, and those are things that we're going to have a lot of people who are going to need jobs in, in those areas. So um, I think it's an opportunity for us to, to you know, use, use technology, use the, the brain power and, and the, the work, work ethos that, that Kiwis do have. Um, to go and just refocus on, okay, this is where the money should be injected, rather than just trying to support something that, whatever whatever we do with the housing market, we you know we we are just going to create another episode. Three years down the line, four years down the line, five years down the line, I think there will be some pain pain experience in that sector. We've got to use that, um, you know, the, the created money from from government to go in and and, and develop other areas. 
Mm-hmm. I agree with you. Absolutely. It should be a strategic opportunity, you know, never let a good crisis um, go to waste. You know, there is an opportunity to create something better for the future. But my fear is that the politicians will be thinking about the election cycle. They'll be thinking about uh, the, the wealth effect and they'll be thinking about um, how can I keep house prices high so I can get to the, le- to the election and get reelected. So I worry that the political agenda is going to effectively run foul of that broader transformational economic agenda, which is the one we should be talking about. And I almost think there has to be some you know, bilateral agreement uh, at the political level to really focus on that strategic reinvestment and reinvigoration of the economies, both here and, uh, and in New Zealand. If we're going to take the opportunity that this creates, um, I just hope that they've got the intestinal fortitude to do that rather than just jump for the quick, ah, oh, well, we'll just uh, you know, do a bit here and try and get house prices up and then everything will be fine, because it won't. Yeah, and the reality of Australia and New Zealand is that if you look at the mineral wealth and the, um, you know, the natural resource wealth that we have, um, both possibly a little bit dependent on, on oil imports, but other than that, um, but to be fair, oil's cheap as chips these days, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, but yeah, if you look at the natural resources that the two countries have, and if, if there is an ability to combine um, tra- you know, cross-Tasman, cross-Tasman supply chains, um, where you know certain things are manufactured here and, and they're assembled in, in Australia and vice versa, that is an opportunity to go and remove the dependence that we've had. Mm. I agree absolutely. No, it does create opportunity, and uh, I hope that um, you know some of those uh, in charge of the agenda really grasp those opportunities, because otherwise uh, it will go to waste. Joe, I really appreciate your time today. It's been fantastic to catch up with you again, and uh, we should do some more of these and perhaps get into some more of the data and those things as uh, as things develop. But uh, great to talk to you today. Well, I'm looking for a job now, so I might I might be looking at actually developing one of these businesses. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> great. Okay. Excellent. I will catch up again soon. Yeah, see you. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Bye.